So this is EVA, Eva, the organization that 15 years ago I founded, and it's an organization of like 12 paid staff with a budget of um, 600, 700,000 euros. We're uh, subsidized by uh, the Flemish government, and I think we're the only um, vegetarian and vegan organization in the world that has uh, structural uh, government subsidies. We get about, I think, 160,000 uh, euros a year from the Flemish government as a cultural adult educational society or organization. And um, I say we, but I'm not part of it anymore. I had a burnout. Um, like, that's not me, but uh, could be. Um, a burnout about one and a half years ago, a burnout especially from leadership. I didn't want to lead people anymore, so now I'm working on myself. So I was home for half a year or, or longer with like some kind of depression. I didn't know what it was. Uh, and then I reinvented myself, and uh, right now, this is my own brand, Vegan Strategist. So I strategize and about communication and, and strategy within the vegan movement. Um, and I do that on a blog that's called veganstrategist.org. And also, I travel the world within the framework of this organization, Center for Effective, Effective Vegan Advocacy, where I travel together with my colleague to other countries um, to talk to uh, vegan groups right there to help them. Um, be more strategic and develop a better communication about um, vegan issues. It's very important and very necessary because I don't know, some people among you may have unpleasant experiences with vegetarians or vegans uh, where you felt like, okay, this is not going to convince me of anything. You know, you just make me feel guilty about eating, eating meat and uh, I'm not going to warm up to your cause if you talk like that. I don't know if you can. If you, if you had some encounters like that. And I'm also involved with an a movement called Effective Altruism. Effective Altruism is about making the world a better place, but especially by combining the heart and the mind. So you're going to like look at what actually works, what is like evidence-based, what are good, um, um, good methods to change the world. All right, so that's about me. And yeah, one more thing. So what I, what I started out as was like, I was talking to people who eat meat, the end consumers, and now I find myself talking to the people talking to people eating meat. So I, I, I'm, I went to like a meta level. So that's, that's what I do now, okay? So the topic I'm concerned about and the organization I worked for is concerned about is meat, and meat is a wonderful problem in the sense that it has a relationship with so many other things. And if you can do something about meat there in the middle, you are doing something about environment, hunger, um, all kinds of health, diseases, and of course, animals. So that's why it's a really interesting cause to work for. This is a, an image or symbolization of the world that vegans want. It's a plant-based world, it's an entirely plant work. Right? You see, this is like a, a broccoli forest and there's like strawberries in the air and so it's entirely made of plants. So that's kind of like the world that we want, plant foods as alternative to meat foods or animal foods. Okay? So the external part of how we explain this. This is a very frustrating problem because it's a huge problem. It's like, I mean, if you do one thing for the world, Going vegan is one of the best things you can do because you have an effect on all these things. If, if there would be one thing as a society, as a, as a culture that we could do that would be great, it would be this because it's, it has such an impact. If I just talk about the animals, it's like 65 billion animals every year that are killed. So that would be avoided. The United Nations says that meat production is like the, in the top three of every major environmental problem. So for every major environmental problem, water pollution or um, climate change, meat, uh, meat is in the top three of the causes, right? So it's a really big problem, and at the same time it's very frustrating because so many people are open to it because they're eating meat, right? So um, if, you, if you look at what the stakeholders say, and stakeholders, I mean this little, little pun, you could consider or you could write it like this, stakeholders. Um, because people are stakeholders, they have a stake in keeping things the way they are, a stake written like that. So what do these people, what are these, these different parties, what do they say? Um, the consumer says, don't touch my plate, I don't want you to like tell me what to eat, you know, there's enough people telling me what to do in all kinds of domains, you don't have to tell me what to eat, I decide, you stay out of my plate. The government says the same thing, 
government doesn't want is very wary of touching people's plates. They consider it something of the private domain. It's very hard to do something about it. The most that they're doing is trying to like decrease the salt or the sugar in some products. That's all they do. Uh, but it's it's very hard to like make them do more because it's a very touchy subject. Um, <clears throat> The, of course, the, the, the sector of the animal, ra the animal raising sector, the, like the farmers, etc., they say, like, don't, don't touch our sector because, like, we're already having trouble, and then you're going to bring in all these vegetarian uh, messages, and, and we're going to suffer even more. Um, there's, of course, there's like uh, our, our tongue and our taste buds and our stomach that has, is like very. Uh, used to getting meat and getting animal products, like we've, we've been raised with that, we've, been, we've evolved eating that for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, so it's a very hard thing to fight. There's all kinds of like um, uh, advertising, uh, a lot of money being pumped into meat advertising, so people say eat, eat more meat, I mean you, you I don't know, in, 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 uh, in, here in the French part of Belgium if you have like commercials also on TV like to eat more meat, uh, we have it in, in Flanders um, and there's like, I mean, this is like, I don't know if you know him, Jürgen Meus, the Flemish chef, chef like he's known to like, when he, when he finally makes like a vegetarian dish on TV in his cooking program, then he says like, well you can add a little bit of chicken, it's really good one of them. There's all kinds of like things that you have to like um, bump up against and fight, and it's it's a really difficult message to break. <laughs> um, so what we did in the end, instead of like saying that uh, we want everybody to go vegan, we made uh, some years ago already we made a change and we um, started talking about meat reduction. Um, so this is not what we want. We want no meat. Right, so if you care about animals like I do, you don't want some to be eaten. You, you don't, you, you don't want any to be eaten. But we assumed that this was a message that would be more palatable to the public. Uh, eating less meat. I think most of you will be open to eating less meat, and uh, less people will be open to eating no meat at all, let alone no animal products. Okay, so uh, we. Try to think of a way that um, we could bring this message, uh, no, a less meat message, in a, in a more in a fun way, and we came up with like one meatless day a week, and that's Thursday veggie day or jeudi veggie um, in French. And um, the idea behind it was that like it had to be something that was um, that was easy to do, that was fun also, and that was concrete enough. So here's some um, some some tips or some well some as aspects that. I think make this one a success, so it's feasible. People think like, okay, one day without meat, I can do that. People in the past, 40 years ago, they had one day with meat, right, a Sunday or whatever, and so now it should be perfectly possible to have at least one day without meat, even though that's not going to be enough. So uh, it's, it's sticky. Sticky means like you will remember it, and uh, it, it's possible to like every day, every every week on Thursday or another day if you want to remember it. It has to be sticky because otherwise people get bombarded with so many messages. It has to be like really, um, it has to stick with them. Um, it's tasty, and taste is like we 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 emphasize taste. It's it's harder for you with with the bicycle bicycle universe. Uh, but taste for us is very central to the topic and is very important. And um, I don't know if you know this quote, it's by Bertolt Brecht, the German uh, playwright. And he says, Erst das Fressen, dann die Moral. Uh, first food and then morality. It means like if, you, if people don't have anything to eat, they won't care about morals. And it applies very much also to the vegan, uh, to, to veganizing or influencing people to eat less meat. If people don't know that there will be very tasty alternatives, then they won't listen to the whole moral argument. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's a low barrier. Again, this is this is about making it easy, and we try to make it very um, positive. We try not to be against the meat industry, but we try to emphasize the benefits of like doing the alternative. So you could say like in your case, you would say like I mean you choose either to like demonize the car and, or you stress. The advantages of being on a bike, right? So that's that's the decoction there. Um, so we try to like um, <laughs> make it make it fun always and have a positive image and not try to make people feel guilty. A big part of the movement of the animal rights movement does exactly that. 
I mean, they just tell like you're a murderer if you're eating meat and you are those leather shoes and, and this is very bad and you're you don't really even know what you do. It's a, that kind of of rhetoric mm -hmm. and nobody feels happy about that. Again, and 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 not winning any customers doing that. So the idea is to that be a lot more positive and also relevant in in terms of like um, we we convinced. Um, I think about 10 cities in Belgium to cooperate with us officially and they're financially supporting this campaign, Brussels also. Um, and they do that because we uh, especially play the cards of uh, the environment and health aspects of meat eating. And those are aspects that are very relevant for um, a government, while animal suffering is not. Animal welfare is a way less important topic for governments than um, health and environment. So here you see a bit of a sacrifice uh, because this is not the topic that within the movement is the most important for us and for me, it's animals. But if you know that some other topic is going to be more convincing, you might as well use that topic, right, or that argument. I'll come back to that. So in Ghent, this is uh, already in 2009, uh, we convinced the city of Ghent to be the first city in the world to have an official vegetarian day. and. Um, uh, so this was like the, we convinced the, um, the councillor of the environment, um, um, and um, we after that uh, after that launch we were like in the in the media all over the world and and up till a year and a half later we got international media every day every week um, every week people calling us from all over the world like how did you do that uh, why is that uh, what happened etc. So it was a pretty successful campaign. Some things that we did was um, to make it practical, like these are vegetarian maps, like you, uh, we, nowadays it's more like apps, but, uh, um, but uh, maps showing like where can you find um, um, vegetarian restaurants or restaurants where you can eat vegetarian, etc. And one, one conclusion or one experience is that people are much more interested in these practical tools, in the how tools than in the why. So I can talk to you like for two hours about why you should be vegetarian or vegan, um, but I know that most people are much more interested in the how, and that's also what keep, what's keeping them back. Many people know why in the meantime, but the how is very difficult for many people. It's not really difficult, but many people have the experience that it's difficult. So emphasizing these practical things. And for instance, if you look at websites of vegetarian, vegetarian websites, the parts that will be most um, visited, that get the most the pages on the website, that get the most visitors, are the recipe pages, the very practical and the restaurant pages, the very practical and the how pages, not the pages that say like why you should be in this for the animals, etc., etc. Um, we made a cookbook about Thursday Veggie Day. Um, this is um, we wanted to show that. Um, it was important and, and everybody could like profit from this trend and so we had a butcher um, for one day he, uh, he made like a vegetarian um, a vegetarian counter and this um, there's an actress over there who is uh, who played uh, a butcher woman in a TV series in a Flemish TV series and she's in, in reality she's a vegetarian she was, so she was the ideal person to, to be there for the for the media um, we also uh, try to put it into the get into the heads of the caterers. So we call them uh, cook pot managers. Cooking pot managers means like uh, you manage a cooking pot, and the bigger the cooking pot you manage, which means that the, 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 the bigger the cooking pot you decide on, the more important you are to us. So like a houseman or a housewife, uh, if they manage a cooking pot for their family of three or four people, they decide for four people, they are less important and less interesting than, for instance, uh, the manager of the restaurant in um, IKEA uh, that serves thousands of people every day, right? So we want to especially reach those, reach those people. And in the meantime, we've developed curricula uh, for um, people who study um, who study in the hotel school because by the time they graduate, they don't know anything about vegetarian cooking. So we wanted to change that. Um, and another important aspect was to change the default option. And I think this is a very promising strategy in general and can be applied to a lot of things. Changing the default option means like the default option is what you get if you don't do any extra effort. Like if you go to a website and you order something and there's like this box uh, subscribing to the newsletter, by default it may be checked or it may be unchecked. 
right? So if it's checked by default, those people will get many more subscribers. So let me give you an idea. Um, in, um, in the schools on Thursday, we, um, we introduced a kind of, not a mandatory, but a default vegetarian option on Thursday. So if you want to get meat on Thursday in the city schools in Ghent, you have to go through a certain kind of trouble. You have to like fill in a paper saying that your kid has to eat meat on Thursday. I don't know why people would do that, but some do. Uh, so um, like like five percent or something does. So ninety five percent of the kids eat um, vegetarian on Thursday. So that's the default option. Another option would be, but no, no, no airline has managed that yet. If I as a vegetarian or vegan uh, get on a plane. Uh, if I don't do anything, I will get a meat dish, and I won't get my vegan dish. So I have to go to the website beforehand, and I said I have to like, order my special meal. What if they turn it around and they said like, uh, you get on the plane and you're a meat eater, and they serve you a meal and it's vegan, and you say like, I'm not a vegan, I didn't order a vegan meal, and they say and tell you that like, I'm sorry, this is the standard, this is the default. If you want a meat uh, meal, you should have ordered it. And that's not taking away people's choice. It's just making people's choice a bit more difficult. And I think that's what we should do all the time. You have to make the, the good thing the easy thing, mm -hmm. and the bad thing the more difficult thing. So that's how it should be with bikes, with health, with all kinds of, of things, right? The, the, the bad thing has to be more difficult. And nowadays, it's not like that. If you look at healthy eating, it's so easy to eat unhealthily. If you are a person here in Brussels who's like, who has little money, and you want to have a full stomach, the best way to get enough calories is to buy junk food. You know, chips and, and potato chips and all kinds of, of trash food, that's, that's what will, will, will fill, it will not be healthy, but it will make you full. And if you have little money, that's, that's the easiest way, all kinds of trash. So I said, uh, we uh, convinced a couple of cities to get on board with us. Uh, so this is Brussels and um, Hasselt. Um, so they are supporting this campaign, and this is a tweet by um, the, the mayor of Ghent. We had um, a specialized agency calculate the, the advertising value of all the, um, the publicity value of all the times that Ghent was mentioned in the newspapers because of this campaign, and the number they came up with was 20 million euros. So they got, for a value of 20 million euros, they got free advertising from from this campaign. So. Yeah, the mayor was very happy with that. <laughs> uh, and and uh, ve the word veggie day, veggie dog in Dutch, well, is also being incorporated into the Dutch language as a result of uh, the campaign, just to show some examples. Now, internally, you may think that, I don't know what you think of this campaign. I mean, most people, non vegetarians, they, they love it and have been asked like, to present it for at the marketing congress, etc. Um, so it's, it's, it seems pretty successful. But that doesn't prevent people inside the movement to hate it. <laughs> um, not all of them, of course, but some people are really, we have to convince them that this campaign actually leads to the things that they want. So let me explain how we try to explain that to them. Um, so if you look at the movement, uh, what our movement wants is two things. It wants that people move in their behavior from meat eaters to vegans. And you can have all kinds of steps in between. You can have people who participate in Meatless Monday or Veggie Thursday, and they can become semi-vegetarians, and they can become vegetarians, and then vegans, etc. And they want also that people do that for the right reasons. Um, so they, you can do it for no reason. You can do it because you don't like the taste of meat. You can do it because um, for your health. You can do it for the environment. But all these reasons within the animal rights movement are not seen as good reasons compared to the real reason, the animal reason. So, if you look at it, everything, for, for a big number of people, everything of this is wrong, and even vegan, for the wrong reasons, is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the only right thing is to be vegan for the animals. Okay, that's, that's, that's what we have to show to a big part of our movement, that it leads to that. And, and for many people, this, this message of reduction, of reducing meat, is, a, is betrayal. Um, I don't know if you can imagine any parallel within your movement or, or organization, if, if there's like fundamentalist and, and more pragmatic people. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain how I, how I explain this to them. So the thing is that what I say is that we want a vegan world. I want it just as much as the like, let's, I, 
it's irrespectful to call them fundamentalists, but let's say, I mean, the people at, the, at that side of the, of the uh, stage. Um, what I'm telling them is we don't need to talk about the animals all the time, and we don't need to, be, we don't need to, pe to ask people to go vegan all the time. We can do it, we can get to the same result with other things. Um, so, the situation today is, is very difficult. I mean, this is how much, we, how much meat we eat today, and this is what is projected to happen by 2050. That's because countries like India and China are eating more and more meat because they're getting richer and richer. So, what is projected is that it's only going to get worse on a global level. And if you look at um, um, the place of animal products in society today, we call this the three ends of justification. Animal products are normal, they're normal to eat, they're, for people they are very natural to eat, and people also think that they are necessary. Right? Maybe you can recognize this. And there's a fourth and they're nice, they're tasty. I myself needed 10 years to stop eating meat because I loved eating meat so much. Um, so for many people, it looks like this. I mean, I, I, I think you can identify if I tell you like go vegan, the, the people who are not vegetarian or vegan among you, you say like, oh my God, what do you eat? What is that? I mean, does everybody even know what veganism is? So it means eating no animal products whatsoever. So it's about no fish, no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no cream, no leather shoes, no etc. So no animal products. Uh, so that sounds very difficult for most people. It sounds like this is like in another universe, okay? It's like for many people you would say like, don't drive a car anymore. Sell your car and, and don't use it anymore. But even more difficult than that. Um, so it's, it's very much swimming against the stream. It's not doing what other people do. <clears throat> so um, one, one question, or well, one answer to the question why most people eat meat is most people eat meat because most people eat meat. Most people do what other people do. And they see around them a certain behavior and they think like, well, everybody does it, so it cannot be that bad. And even people who, um, uh, even people who um, have doubts and they say like, oh my God, what is happening to the animals? It's cruel, it's horrible. But then they see 99, 97% of people participate in that system, they think like, okay, well, I must be seeing something wrong. So we need uh, a bigger amount of a critical mass. We need more people to problematize that. And, and you need to see people around you acting differently so that you start to see like, okay, this is actually a problem and there is actually a solution, okay? So which arguments, this is the first part of, the, of what I explained internally, which arguments do we use? Um, Arguments are within our movement are moral and are non-moral. Moral is like these poor animals are dying and suffering. The non-moral arguments are health arguments. You can get like you increase your risk of heart disease and cancer, and diabetes, and um, maybe other things. Maybe your girlfriend eats vegan and that's why you become a vegan. Or maybe um, you are in a vegan um, environment and that's why you eat vegan. Or maybe you don't have money to buy meat or whatever and vegan products are cheaper. So you understand that these are not moral arguments, that, that you don't have to be like converted to the vegan cause to act like that, right? So, but at the same time, our movement has very much a moral focus. It very much focuses on these moral arguments because we think that they work. Um, we think that, for instance, when slavery was abolished in uh, the United States, we think that was because of moral outrage. We think that people were so infuriated and said, like, this is not fair, we cannot have our fellow human beings in chains, we have to abolish that. But they forget that there were other arguments, for instance, the steam machine helped make sure that it was, at some point, uh, in some circumstances, cheaper to have machines than slaves. Slaves have to be fed and they have to be housed, etc. So machines could be cheaper. So you can imagine that this played a very important role for slave owners to like switch slowly but so surely, right? So moral arguments are not all there is. It's not just going to happen by moral arguments alone. And people in our movement, a big part of in our movement, like I said, they want people to do the right thing for the right reasons. But we cannot expect that. We cannot expect everybody to be like us in that sense. So, what I'm saying is right now, for all of you also who are not on board with this message, with the vegan message, is that compassion, being compassionate, 
putting your compassion into practice is too costly, it's too difficult. And as you have um, a lower availability of alternatives, the required effort becomes greater, right? So if you don't have, uh, to, to put it in your terms, if you don't have much alternatives for the car, and if you don't have like bicycle lanes, etc., you have to be a really committed person to not use the car. And another example is, uh, I travel a lot, and I know that flying is bad for the environment. I just came back uh, Saturday from, um, from South America to, to, uh, to do trainings there. And, I mean, what is my alternative to flying there? It's taking the boat, right? And it takes like 10 days. So it's not a good alternative. So you can imagine, if I really want to be like environmentally conscious at that point and take the boat, I have to be really, really committed. And we don't want that. We don't want people to need that much of a commitment to do the right thing. That's way too hard. So we have to make it easier. So we have to have this situation. The alternatives are easy, available, cheap, they're everywhere, they're good, and then the required effort goes down. Okay? It's like in the, I always ask my, my vegan audiences, like, who would be still a vegan? So I talk to people who are all vegans, right? And I ask them, who would be still a vegan if this was the only thing you could eat that's vegan? And of course, everybody says, yeah, yeah, I still would be. Because I, I want to show them the real, the real thing. Uh, and then I ask, like, yeah, okay, maybe, but would you have gone vegan in the first place if this was the only thing you could eat? They can't know that. Even if they say yes, they can't know that because you can't know how much how much the situation influences your attitude, right? So we know maybe that one Buddhist monk uh, <laughs> vegan, and then but when we discovered 30 years ago we could like have like pretty good macrobiotic dishes by combining pulses and grains, so more people could, and then there were really good meat substitutes, and more people would go uh, would be prepared to change, and then maybe in the future, and you may think this is yucky. And um, we invent, uh, well, it already exists, but it's not commercialized yet, artificial meat based on, 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 um, on uh, cell cultures. So it doesn't require the death of an animal anymore. And it will be exactly the same thing. And I think if we market that well, then many more people would uh, jump on the, on the wagon. So what we do basically, and what you have to do, I think, is, I mean, suppose you are this person's trainer. And you can tell her, come on, you can, you can do it, you can jump this bar, you can, you can be the best in the world, and you can chain, chain, uh, train, train harder, etc. That's one thing you could do. What's the other thing you could do here? Lower the bar. Yeah, you can lower the bar. It doesn't work in sports, of course, it will be cheap. <laughs> you get the metaphor. You can lower the bar, and you can make it easier for people. And then, we can lower the bar so much that in the end, changing doesn't require any motivation at all anymore. And the funny thing is that in our movement, if we make going vegan so difficult, so, e so easy, which would be a great thing, some people wouldn't like that. Because they want people to go vegan for the right reasons. <laughs> you cannot do it for no reason, right? And so, and then I tell them that, uh, and this is very much overlooked in any social movement, that most of the time, when we try to change behavior, we think in terms of like, we're going to change people's attitude, and then it will follow that they will change their behavior, right? If I give you a leaflet with all kinds of information about what happens to the animals, like suffering, etc., I will hope that she will read that, her attitude will change, and then that your behavior will change, and you will stop eating animals. Does it happen like that? Sometimes it does. Sometimes people's attitude is changed because of some information, uh, you give them a leaflet why it's good to bicycle, and they change, and they read that, and they change. So this is the this is the way we think normally. But of course, there is an attitude behavior gap. This is an illustration that goes together with the research research into professors into um, ethics, moral philosophy professors. And they ask these people, um, do you think it's morally okay to kill and eat animals? And about seventy percent of these moral philosophy professors said, no, that's not okay. Do you know how many of those professors actually did not eat animals? It was not more than among the general population. So you see, it's not because they knew something and because they were at the right attitude, there was any difference in their behavior. Okay? Um, the same thing here. These are, uh, this is a number about doctors and nurses in the US. 
you would expect that these people have the right attitude about being healthy, but 44 to, uh, 45 to 55% of these people are overweight. So the, again, attitude behavior gap. So apart from this, we can also work this way. Okay, it's not either or, it's both, we need both. So behavior change can also come first and then people's attitude changes. I don't know if you can imagine examples from that in your movement. Let me give you some, um, some others. <laughs> so this is um, about uh, the, <coughs> when in the United States seatbelt laws were introduced and people had to wear seatbelts all of a sudden. There was a lot of protests. A lot of people said, like, I don't want to do this. This is annoying. Uh, I don't want to wear the seatbelt. But they had to, okay? Because it was a law. They had to change. They had to change their behavior. They had to wear the seatbelts. And a couple of years later, they asked people, like, what do you think of this law? And most people said, good law. I like it. So what happened there? What happened was obviously that their behavior preceded their attitude change. Okay, so the attitude change followed a change in behavior. And what happened maybe was that, for instance, these people said like, well, actually, this isn't that difficult. They, they had to wear it, and then they saw like, it, it's not that much of a problem. Or they saw that it actually helped. It actually made them feel safer. And then they started to say like, this is good, this is safe, etc. And their attitude was changed as a result of the behavior change. Another example is a study where they saw that, so all you need is less, is about downshifting. You know the, the term downshifting? So it means like consuming less. It could be, for instance, instead of using a car or having only a car, it would be like owning a bike instead or using a car from somebody else. That's downshifting, consuming less. And um, so you can try to get people to like, um, to do that for the right reasons. You can tell them like you have to do that because our planet is in danger. And that works to a certain extent. But what they discovered was that um, people who had to downshift at a certain moment because all of a sudden they lost their job for instance and they had less money, so they could not spend as much as they used to, they had to downshift, that they developed these attitudes afterwards. They started to think like, okay, I care about the planet. I'm doing this for the planet. So one, one possible explanation is, is what they call self-identification theory. So in psychology, so people started to identify as somebody who cares about the planet. That's why also it may help, for instance, to like make people take a very small step. Like you give them, a classic example is like you sell them a little pin to wear or on, the, on, their, on their chest, uh, for instance, against AIDS or whatever. And as soon as they do that, as soon as they have that behavior, they start thinking like, I'm a person who cares about AIDS. And they go further and further, and you can ask them more and more of them, of them. all right? So the way our movement thinks is usually like this. The more people care about animals, attitude, the, the more they will eat vegan behavior. But it also works like this. The more people eat vegan, the more they will care about animals, okay? Behavior first, and then attitude. And that's why alternatives are so important. And that's why a big part of this, this movement and the shift will be made possible by big companies who are producing, well, new foods. And, and we are in the, like the, what I call the fifth generation of uh, meat substitutes, meat alternatives. They didn't used to be very good. This one is uh, invented by a world-famous uh, chemistry professor at Stanford University, one of the, the uh, best universities in the world. He, he left his job and he said, like, he's a vegan, and he said, like, I'm going to use my knowledge of chemistry to invent the ideal burger. I don't want it to taste like crap anymore. I want to make something that people cannot tell the difference uh, from the real thing. Okay? And this one actually bleeds um, because it has <laughs> heme iron uh, in, in the, the heme iron in the, in the plant, make sure that it like, leaves like a little bloody trail in the pan. I don't know if that's like the ideal selling argument, but it's just like to show how real it is. Um, this is the first cultured meatball. So this is made without an animal. I mean, based on animal DNA, etc. Uh, but made, grown, grown on, on the basis of cell cultures. It's not commercialized yet, but it could be commercialized maybe in five to ten years. And that could be like a complete shift. And that's why I think that we could have in this movement 
a technological revolution first that introduces a moral revolution. Okay, so meat will become maybe redundant before it becomes immoral. And that's not the way our movement thinks about it. Our movement thinks like we have to show the people it's immoral. But I think it's going to be the other way around. Um, so what could happen is that we can have all these products. Yes. For all these products, the people are trying to like make synthetic versions. And I'm entirely convinced that there will be a future when they say, like, can you imagine when the stuff actually came from animals and that we had to kill animals for this? And people will say, like, how barbaric? How could people do that? That's how it will be in, I don't know, 100 years' time, maybe less. Um, so without needing these animals. Um, and then, of course, restaurants and supermarkets, etc., also make it more easy. And the second question after like which argument do we use is which challenge do we put to people? What do we ask them? If I want to change you, do I ask you like, do I tell you go vegan or do I tell you something else? Okay. So this is a standard message in the movement, go vegan. And people ask that because, well, if you want people to go vegan, if that's where we want to get people, why would you ask anything else? Okay. Um, it could be like, what, where, if you want to get cars out of Brussels, why would you start anywhere else? Why would you lower your expectations? Well, sometimes to get something, to actually get something. Um, so increasing the number of vegans is the default modus operandi of this movement. <clears throat> and I don't think it's the best one. It's, I think uh, a lot of people who are reducing is more important. Is more important for several reasons, but mainly the fourth, because I think that is what can tip the system the fastest. So I always compare it with the gluten free movement. <clears throat> so wherever I talk in the world, it's very strange, but uh, gluten free, that phenomenon, is everywhere. It's the new Al-Qaeda, see? Um, so in every country in the world, they have this like explosion of gluten-free products and explosion of people who avoid gluten. And um, why is that? Well, it's because on the one hand, you have people, there's one out of hundred people, who um, cannot eat any gluten whatsoever. They, they get sick or they die or whatever they do if they have gluten, right? And on the other hand, <clears throat> you have people who think that they should avoid gluten, right? Uh, for some reason, or they feel better, or whatever, and science says it's not worth it, don't do it if you don't have any medical uh, recommendation to do that, etc. I'm not going to judge those people, but the fact is that um, the second group is a lot bigger than the first. <clears throat> and so, people who are really allergic to gluten, they might be irritated with these fake gluten free people because they make it confusing. To waiters in restaurants, the, the, the waiter in the restaurant will say like, oh yeah, you tell me you're gluten free, but we had a person over here yesterday and they ate a bit of bread and they didn't die, you know? So, and, and that confuses the waiters and that could irritate the real gluten free people, you see? But on the other hand, the, the advantage for this person was that all of a sudden, in recent years, she has a, a much wider choice in products. And so what happened was that this bigger group of fakers created a much bigger demand and just a bigger supply, all right? So if you look at the vegetarian movement, it's the same in the, in the gluten-free thing. So vegans and vegetarians, a small group, but meat reducers, a much bigger group, who would say here that you, you are a meat reducer? Who are like, it was like eating less meat than they used to be. So, yeah, see, that's quite a, quite a few people. Um, so that's gonna be, who is vegan here? Yeah. Oh, that's more, that's more than usual, that's because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, it would be one person or something, if that, okay? Um, so, um, uh, so, so this, is the, this is the proportion. It's the same thing with gluten-free, it's the same thing here. And that's why what happens is that this group of people has a much bigger impact on the market. If I ask producers of vegan products, who their primary target audience is, their primary customers are, they will not say it's the vegans, it's the meat reducers, because they're, they're much more interesting to cater to. 1% of vegans is not worth setting up a company for, certainly not in a small country. Okay, so what these people do, the people who don't go there all the way, they make it easier for everybody to go further and further on that scale of behavior change, right? So. 
And that's why I tell the people in the movement that we have to get rid of like this black and white vision of veganism. That there's like, that you are vegan or you're not. In our movement, something you hear quite often is being vegan is like being pregnant. You are it or you are not. Right? A very black, white, a binary way of thinking which I think is not productive at all. And when I say it's not black and white, then some of them get very angry. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we want people to be vegan. Behavior change and to believe that animals are not here for use, attitude change. So we want these two things, and these two things can be achieved by talking not about the animals all the time, and by not talking about go vegan all the time. Why? <clears throat> because, well, we will get there with these other messages. So we will get there. So what I'm saying to my audiences is always like, instead of this picture, we should have, um, well, it's coming in, in another, in another slide. But what happens is when the choices increase, so when these all these reducers make sure that there's more choice, then becoming stricter gets easier, right? And when <clears throat> when people eat vegan for whatever reason, to whatever degree, they will become way less defensive. Can you imagine if I gave a talk about veganism here, the difference if you had had a really had a few great vegan meals and you know it's possible. And on the other hand, if you just had eaten a bad piece of tofu and you were convinced that it was really terrible food, can you imagine your, the difference in your openness towards my message? Right? Okay, so instead of this, we should have this. Okay, this is my favorite part of the presentation. <laughs> uh, so it's encouraging every step that people take for whatever reason they do it. Okay, I don't know if you can see parallels with your movement, but you could say, like, like, maybe some people say, like, you have to drop the car, the car is killing us, or whatever, and you have, can may have, maybe have people who say, like, you have to use less, you have to use your car less, and your bike more, etc. Okay, and I'll, I'll, the last part is some um, communication tips I give to <coughs> activists. Normally there's 12, but I, I, I only took out the most, the ones I think, I hope, are the most relevant. So the first two you already know, this is like to adapt your ask. Adapt what you ask of people. Don't have like one message that you think you have to bring, because it's your message. You have to think about what your audience wants and adapt your message towards. So it could be, in some circumstances you would say like, okay, Cars are evil, but in other circumstances it could be like, we have to use less cars, we have to have less cars in the city. The second one is to adapt your arguments. So in my case I spoke about animal rights arguments, health arguments, environmental arguments. You could also imagine that, uh, well, I'm sure that you use arguments like, it's good for the environment, it's good for your health, it's cheaper. And maybe you like some arguments more than others, I don't know. Okay? But you have to be adaptive and see who you have, who you have in front of you to know which one works best. The third one, and I think this is the, this is the most important skill that any activist in any social movement can have, is to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And we don't do that. When we, when we try to influence behavior, we are in a room in our own shoes. I mean, when we live, we are ourselves, we are in our own shoes, and it's not obvious and not easy to imagine how other people think, what they need, etc. All right? So, be in other people, people's shoes. Another way I put this is, uh, with, with this letter word, it's, 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 it means you are not your audience. You are not the um, audience that you want to reach. It's very logical in sales. If you want to sell, Soap, if you set up a soap company, you're not going to say like, this is the soap I like, and no matter if nobody likes it, this is the soap I'm going to try to sell. Right? That would be stupid. Right? <coughs> if nobody buys your soap, there must be something that they don't like about your soap. So you try to adapt your product, your message, and we're all in the business of selling a product. You're selling the message of like bite more or whatever. We're selling the message of like eat less meat, eat no meat. So it is 
a product or a message that you are selling. That's the way you have to look at it. And you cannot just sell the message that you want to bring. This would be like, like to, to use the, the shoe metaphor, it would be like saying that everybody has to wear your shoes, if they're fit or not. Okay? And it's tempting to think that this doesn't apply, that this only applies to sales and not to our message, because our messages, they are so much more important, right? And we have the right message. We have the right message, we are right, so we shouldn't adapt it too much. Well, maybe that's true to a certain extent, you shouldn't adapt it too much so that it becomes like entirely something different, but there's definitely some things that you can and should adapt in. I'm always giving like some examples um, to show people how different other people may be. Um, this is, um, and so this is in the field of meat, and this is the heart attack grill heart attack grill in the United States. Um, and it's a burger restaurant where the burgers are, they're called the triple bypass burger and the quadruple bypass burger. And so you can see how the waitresses are walking around, right? So you literally have the risk of like getting a heart attack when you eat in that restaurant. And there was actually, there was um, a guy greeting the people when they came in, saying like, well, hello, welcome to a restaurant. And in the US, they can do that because the wages are cheap. They can, set, they can put a, pe a person at the entrance. And this person was a very big person, and he died of a heart attack. Um, so what I'm saying is that like, people are walking into these traps with their eyes open. It's not going to help like, to, to tell people, like, this isn't healthy. Stop doing that. They know it is, right? So it takes a lot more. So that's. That's one exercise to try to be in other people's shoes. I mean, not everybody's that extreme, but they're going to have like a quadruple bypass burger in a restaurant like that. But uh, but still, they exist. Um, so this is a, this is one way of, of putting it. Um, so if if somebody says, for instance, if you tell me, well, going vegan, that's very difficult, and I say, and I would say that many people in in, in this movement do, it is, it is easy, it is easy. And you say, no, it's not. And I say, yes, it is easy. <laughs> I mean, who am I helping? Who am I influencing? If I don't take your reality and your experience seriously, right? So this tall guy is saying to the little person, uh, is saying it's not deep, but it depends on their experience. Same thing here. Is it a six or is it a nine? It depends on where you're standing, right? If I, if I show this, activists within our movement, they would say, no, 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 well, murder is murder, <laughs> you know? And you can't turn that around, you can't see it from two, two places, okay? To a certain extent, that's true, of course, but still, there is a difference in perception uh, according to where you stand, where you are, okay? Um, I think this is a very fundamental part of, of, um, of doing activism and outreach to people. I think when you talk to people, people remember the process more than the content of the conversation. So the process is like, how did we relate? Was it fun conversation? Was it a friendly conversation? Yeah. Or was it something like hostile? Was I feel, was I, did I feel guilty because of this person? So that process is more important than the content. The content is what you say, the arguments that you use. So that's why I think uh, being nice, being sympathetic is really important in conversations. And this, is a, this is the slide of the, of the, of the night. Tonight that, that somebody used, I think it's 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 a very nice uh, way of putting it. So it's not easy, especially like in the vegan movement. I mean, I'm asking people to be nice to people who are doing things that they really hate and that that hurt them, and that that I mean, yeah, it's uh, many people are calling meat eaters murderers, but it doesn't help anything. Okay, it's it's, it's a default position almost of that many vegans to think like you are. This, this thing that you're doing is evil, but people will just feel accused, and feeling accused and feeling guilty is just not a good recipe for behavior change or attitude change. Um, so yeah, these are two people, it's not relevant to you, but two people in the vegan movement um, who, who put it like this, don't be a dick, be a nice, be a nice person. Anger, I don't know if you, if you deal with anger in this movement. Um, <laughs> Apparently you do. Um, so, 
in, in the vegan movement, that's that's a, a big problem. I mean, people get angry so much because, I mean, and it's a very natural reaction. If you're against something, if you see that something is terrible, there's something like very seriously wrong, you can get angry and outraged, right? But the thing is to like use that productively. And if you're going to be angry at a person that you're talking to, that person will just feel that that, that anger is directed at them, and they will again, there will be little chance that they change. So it's more productive, for instance, to direct the anger at the system mm -hmm. and say like, well, the system is wrong and the politics are wrong and maybe it's nobody's fault but we have to do something about it and nobody's like to blame. Sometimes it's better to put it like this, but not like to give the impression that you're angry. And I, in our movement, it's so easy for other people to feel guilty and accuse and blame. If I'm going to sit here with you and I'm eating a vegan meal and you have a steak for dinner, that may already be enough to make you uncomfortable. Can you imagine that? Because I don't have to say anything. You may already feel a bit guilty because you understand that there's a problem. And so that's why when I want to talk to you about that issue, I have to like walk on eggshells, be very, very careful so that I don't make you feel more guilty by what I say. That's, that's the way I talk to people. Um, there's a big discussion in our movement, and maybe you have it too, if, you, if, if we have to be nice or more confrontational. Confrontational means like, yeah, more aggressive and more, yeah, civil disobedience, that kind of thing. Um, do you know this? <coughs> have anybody heard of this? Sea Shepherd? Sure. So Sea Shepherd is an organization that has boats that go into the sea and that kind of like try to ram boats that are hunting whales. And they get away with that. This is like as confrontational as you can be in the movement. You, you try to sink boats basically, right? <laughs> it's pretty confrontational. Um, why do they get away with that? Why do you think that this is acceptable? It's a very simple answer. People don't eat whales. If you do it with pigs, with pig factories, etc., on land, it will be a completely different story. So what I think is that if you look at how confrontational you can be in a certain cause, that's directly related to the public support you have for that. If somebody is going to abuse a cat and put a video of cat abuse on the internet, the whole world will be against him. And you can call him a murderer, and that's fine. And also with Cecil the Lion and that lousy dentist, you know, who shot the lion, he was like the most hated person in the world for a while, right? Because people don't eat lions and they, they don't shoot lions themselves. So there's a, a big public support to be against this uh, hunt, trophy hunt. But if you go lower down the scale and you end up like with meat, there's way less public support for that. So you have to be much more careful and your forcefulness or your confrontationalism has to drop. And you can see, for instance, if you go a little bit up, foie gras, many people don't eat it because it's like shishi, it's for the rich and, it, and okay, many people think already that it's cruel, it's force fed force feeding animals, there you have more, more leeway and there you can be again more confrontational and you can be more graphic with your images and you can be more aggressive and you can be may, maybe even more accusing because you have a big part of the, of the population on your side so I think with, with, with the, the issue of, I'm not, not, not sure how you feel it, how it is where you are with the issue of, of bicycling and, and, and that topic, I think it's a pretty approachable thing and something that has public support, even though people are very married to their cars, uh, probably. So I'm not sure how it is there. Um, be welcoming. In, I don't think you have it in your movement, but in this movement, in the vegan movement, there is such a thing as a vegan, which is an identity. And there is a very much uh, like discussion about who is one and who is not one, right? If you do this or that, you're not a real one. You don't have some. I hope you don't have it in the in the in your movement. Like, is there something like you're a real bicyclist or you're not a real one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Everyday one. Huh? Everyday. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you do it in degrees. But like for instance, yeah. So for instance, I mean, we could say like, I mean, I'm sometimes accused of not being a real vegan because I drink alcohol. Um, I mean, you can't drink alcohol as a vegan, but there might be animal ingredients in the bottle. And it's not mentioned on the bottle of wine, 
And so if it's not mentioned, if I can't see it, I will drink it. I will give the wine the benefit of the doubt. So um, that's, to some people that's considered not vegan, even if I do that like. So, so there's a very much like a, a fight on the identity. Um, and that's why some people are not welcomed. And that's why sometimes I see like, I have the impression that um, veganism was developed by two people who said like, let's try to invent the world's smallest group. <laughs> um, and it's already so difficult for people to go vegan and then some of us are saying like, stop, are you vegan enough? <laughs> are you vegan enough to join me? Or do you have to be like a part of some other club? You know? So we are not always open and not welcoming to everybody because they, they differ from us. And I don't know if you if you have the if you know the experience of like for instance the vegetarians and the vegans they fight um, because and it's like that in a lot of movements I don't know if you if you can imagine but um, Freud actually called it the narcissism of small differences and it's it's about like that we sometimes see the people who differ a tiny bit from us as more the enemy than the people who are very far away from us. It's very strange. And one explanation could be that, um, that they are more a threat to our identity than the people who are far away from us. They kind of like, we kind of like think that like they may be right, so they threaten our identity. While the people far away from us, the ones with the, driving the SUVs all the time, they're not a threat to us because they don't threaten our identity. They don't threaten that we are right. Does that make sense? Yep. And then, yeah, so, so one thing, uh, that's the last one I, I say, and I don't know if it applies to you, but to forget about purity and perfection. That's exactly the thing I said, like, you are sometimes put out of the group and not considered to be one of us if you make some exceptions or if you eat this or that, and that's very, very um, unproductive, I think. So, um, especially because, so one example that I give is that, like, suppose that one of you invites me for dinner, and uh, you're not vegan, and you've never cooked a vegan meal in your life, but you've gone through all the trouble to like look on the internet for a vegan recipe, you go to a health food store where you've never been, and you buy some products that you never bought before, and you don't know how to use them, but you go through all this trouble, and you make a vegan lasagna. And I sit down to eat, and then I discover that the lasagna sheets themselves, the, the pasta dough, contains eggs. You've overlooked that. And I say, like, sorry, I can't eat that. It's an animal product that contains eggs. And I think, as non-vegans, you get that this would be very stupid of me. And you would see. What I want to do is to give the impression, I, I don't want to give you this impression that what I'm doing and what I want you to do, that is extremely difficult. So now and then, I'm going to like make a little exception to, to seem more accessible. You understand? <coughs> so the thing is that, if you look at the impact of animal rights activists, at their impact on eating animals, on the one hand, you have their own consumption, what they eat. So if they don't eat animals, they will save a number of animals. But they, if they effectively communicate about not doing that, and they can influence other people, they can save potentially many more animals. So this part is much more interesting and much more important than that part. So one, one way of putting it is, um, what goes into your mouth is less important than what comes out of it. It's a quote from the Bible that is actually true in this case. Um, so this is something that we have to deal with in the movement. We call it the vegan police. So it's the, it's the, it's the people who are saying like, oh, those are, you are you say you're a vegan, but there's probably like uh, something non-vegan in those shoes, right? So that's, that's, it. that's like looking at the details and saying like, uh, you are part of it, you are not. That's, I mean, that's very internal, okay? Um, so, that's not, that's, that's not what I think is productive and that's what I try to tell people we should not do, all right? So this is, this is how far you can go. So we let you know what you can do, uh, which is, of course, not an interesting attitude. All right, so this is what I have to tell you. Just some questions that maybe raise discussion or that maybe, um, will inspire you. Are there arguments that you believe in more but that may be less effective, like to get people on the bike or whatever? Maybe there's a difference between the arguments that you believe in are the most important but that don't get the most people to move. Okay? 
Can people do what you want them to do in steps versus all at once? So maybe you have a target for Brussels or for Bologna um, or for individuals. You have a certain target, that, something that you want them to do, but maybe you can ask them something different that's less than that. Um, do people's motivations matter to you? Or does it just matter like that they do it, that they change their behavior? Do you have in your movement a problem with fundamentalism? I, I see you have a problem with anger. Um, maybe you have other problems. Is there an enemy in your movement and how do you treat them? Is it the cars? Is it the government? Is it um, other bicyclists? I don't know. Um, does it make sense for you to be adaptive? Adaptive is that means like, are you, can you like adapt your approach according to who you talk to? Um, is it like, does it make sense to like, for instance, when you talk to a government, to use completely different arguments than, you, than when you talk to an individual bicyclist? All right. So that's um, what I have to say. Um, I hope there's some like uh, connections with uh, with your movement, and it was um, useful. Uh, like I said, it's normally I bring it to an audience of animal rights people. Um, so I guess we discuss now. I think I've, I've kind of like for yeah. yeah. time. Yeah, that's yes. perfect. perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <laughs>